Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, in the wake of yesterday's low pressure system that is now currently early this morning sitting here over parts of Wisconsin, we got a couple of things to be talking about. First of all, on the back side of this where winds have finally calmed down a bit, we do have our risk of a frost and freeze early this morning. You can see that the main front is pushed pretty far to the south by early in the morning here, and that has brought some pretty sizable temperature changes behind this particular uh, system. Looking just at the last 24 hours of temperature change, you can really pick out. Now, this was pretty early in the morning, about 2 30, you can see where that frontal boundary was sitting here in terms of the temperature change behind it. So many folks that have been down here that have seen extremely hot temperatures breaking all time records for the beginning of October are finally going to be getting, getting some cooler air pushing into that area, starting to feel a bit more like fall as the day on Thursday goes through. But just taking a look at our all hazards weather map, what are we watching for our, our primary concerns today? Well, your eyes are drawn right into this area where we do have our frost and freeze uh, advisories and warnings out in place, generally west of the 100th meridian, which runs right about in through here. So taking a look at some of these early morning temperatures. Again, this was about 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so we were expecting, you know, since we still have about three more hours until sunrise, expecting to continue to see some of these numbers drop off. But we can see in parts of western South Dakota, temperatures are already getting down into the low 30s and in some locations below 30, like right in through here. But of course, we're going up a little bit in elevation. But we are seeing in western Nebraska, temperatures getting down also uh, into the upper 20s. So this will be the corridor right in through here that we're going to watch carefully to see these temperatures really plummet uh, in the next few hours here into the early morning uh, with some of the lighter winds that have come in here. Now, it's not going to be permanent cold. Watch this. This is daily maximum temperature. So already in the day on Thursday, we do get a bit of a recovery. I mean, you're going to see high temperatures in that same area that get down into the upper 20s that are going to rebound close to 60, maybe 65 degrees in some places. The main frontal boundary is still sitting here. So another scorcher on tap for much of the southeastern part of the United States. But take a look at how temperatures are projected to change over the coming days. It's really kind of coming in waves. And this animation always place so fast initially, but look at this. So this is now Friday's high temperatures. Wow, really feeling a bit more like fall right in through this quarter. Some cooler, drier air does move in. While folks down here, you know, thinking about Atlanta, almost getting up to triple digit heat again on Friday. But moving this forward into Saturday, Sunday, into Monday, we do see a rebound of some warmth coming right back up into the central and high plains here, getting temperatures back up into the 60s. So things are kind of coming in waves in October as they typically do, such that by next Tuesday, out ahead of our next system that goes through parts of central Canada, we do get a bit of a warm up here uh, coming through the central United States. So here's next Wednesday's highs and Thursday. But behind each one of them, we do get a cool off. The fronts are much more pronounced this time of year. But the good thing that you see in this animation is what we are doing to temperatures here over the southeastern part of the United States. We're really breaking down uh, that overall pattern, flattening things out a bit in the flow of the jet stream, which is going to be quite beneficial to that region. Watch what our overnight low temperatures do too. Of course, this morning, you know, we're expecting to see, like we talked about, a west of that 100th meridian, we're going to be getting down into those overnight lows, uh, excuse me, early morning lows where we do see freezing. But let's let this play. We'll step it back and show you what happens on Friday morning. So by Friday, we're going to be watching our frost threat really just clipping through the northern part of North Dakota, getting here into the northern part of Minnesota. And as we play forward, that cooler air shoves over to the northeast. So really upstate New York through Maine, seeing those cooler temperatures as warmer overnight lows rebound for the weekend out ahead of a system coming through on Saturday, Sunday. We'll talk about that in a few seconds. Behind that one, a front passes. But notice our temperatures on Sunday night getting into Monday uh, drop back off into the low to middle 30s. So in other words, no big frost event sweeping through here at the beginning of October. Getting out to Tuesday, Wednesday. And Thursday, again, I'll even take it forward because you might be thinking that's going to come on through with the big frost. It doesn't. This is the 11th and 12th. We keep seeing the colder air really stay at bay up in the Canadian prairies and in the high plains uh, out to the west. So that just looks at your next nine days or so of highs and lows in terms of temperatures. The one thing that this pattern does not do, it does not bring in any significant accumulation of growing degree day units. Uh, and so you can see here that looking over the next nine days, what we're expecting to accumulate 
you know, honestly, this whole area north of that line I just drew not anticipated to get over 100. And some places up there in the Dakotas, you know, getting between 20 and 60 GDUs. The same thing goes for parts of Wisconsin and Minnesota as well. So this is a more fall-like pattern, which we don't expect to accumulate much heat, but there are some places up there that desperately need it. So take a look at this map. What you're looking at here is total accumulated growing degree day units using a base of 50 and a max of 86. So that's the corn formula. But this map shows how much accumulated starting on the 15th of April up until October 1st. I'm just going to draw a line here, a white line in here showing you everywhere south of that white line we're talking about the accumulation of GDUs uh, that were greater than 2400. 2400. That's kind of a bit of a number that sticks in our heads when we think about corn maturity. So we're specifically speaking about the midsection of the United States here. That's what would have been happening if you would have planted by June, um, excuse me, by uh, April 15th. But as I just almost slipped up, June first numbers look like this. Now that white line shows you where that 2400 number is to the south of it. And you can see that since then we've had a relatively cool summer. And I started asking myself some questions about this summer. So the first thing I want to show you is this. What I did for the month of September when we did get a bit of a rebound in heat in the north central part of the United States, well that rebound in heat did not come with a lot of additional sunlight. And what you're looking at here is the average daily cloud cover for all of September. And when you start to see, you know, 50 to 70 percent, that's what we're seeing in this area, 50 to 70 percent cloud cover. That was a lot of days where the temperatures were warm, but we weren't getting that direct sunlight. We were getting a lot of um, overcast skies. Now, certainly very sunny here and sunny here under the ridge, but I just want to point that out. And as a result, there was a pretty sizable deficit in the accumulation of solar energy. Now, it's going to be the same color bar, but flipped when I show you this one. This is cumulative downward solar flux. So what does that mean? This is watts per meter squared. Okay, so that, that's power per square meter uh, of um of sunlight, visible sunlight. And what I want, what you're looking at here is a deficit. And I, I'm sorry my color bar is so small, but this is a 5,000 watt per meter squared deficit down to a uh, fifth, uh, excuse me, an 11,000 uh, deficit. And so this is compared to clear sky. So again, this just reinforces the idea that this region, really extending here through the Canadian prairies over to Ontario and Quebec, spent so much time with that storm track going through like this, keeping things uh, more cloudy. Uh, than otherwise. So the warmth was not necessarily accompanied by a lot of additional sunlight. And it makes sense because I know this is kind of a difficult map to see some of the numbers, but what I did also for the month of September was looked at the number of days where we had precipitation greater than an inch. And when we start from the northwest, you know, gosh, getting over here on, on the windward slopes, 15 plus days of rainfall greater than a tenth of an inch, that's half the month spent wet. Even got some wetter days here into the Columbia Basin and in the Snake River Valley, two to three days there. Certainly impacting in Montana, um, worried about uh, getting the hay, uh, a good, uh, good last cutting of hay. Same thing for Washington and parts of Oregon. Wherever you don't see numbers on this, that was where things were very dry. Uh, zero zero days. So I talked about this in the long range, but look at these regions down and through here. There were a lot of places that didn't have any, but you come right back up into that same quarter we just talked about because we averaged between 10 and 15 days of getting rainfall greater than a tenth of an inch. Well, of course it makes sense that it was so cloudy. Now recently, some of the really heavy rain we've seen over the last couple of weeks, I'm going to just show you the map on the right is looking at the last 14 days departure from normal, going up to a max of five inches more than normal. I want to take you right in here. Let's maybe draw that in white. This video went viral yesterday on the Grand River. This was some of the debris on the river that was kind of collecting here. And what you've been watching on the left is uh, that debris in that river pushing against uh, this railroad track. And uh, what you're going to see here in the next few moments was it just basically destroyed it and just pushes it all away. I'm sure a lot of you saw this video and some of you may have witnessed this, but this is the power moving water and look at how much debris is in this. And it's amazing. A year ago, this same area was so dry. And now this year, all they've seen is just repeated rainfall events and so much flooding culminating, I think, in this video that you see over here on the left. And this is going to continue to cause problems over the coming days. Now, I want to show you another uh, set of images here. This was just the last 72 hours of total accumulated precipitation. You can clearly identify where the ridge has been sitting 
and the flow around it setting up this ring of fire type precipitation. Heavy rain from Texas and New Mexico, so this is hitting right here around Lubbock and north toward Amarillo. Uh, we're talking major cotton productivity uh, area, but coming through Kansas, through southeastern Nebraska, really hitting areas and through here hard, then through central Iowa up into southern Wisconsin, southern uh, Michigan. Very, very heavy rainfall, and on the north side of this, very cold rainfall. But let me get these uh, drawings off here and take you right down here. Uh, Jerry sent me this uh, great picture just to show you what's going on with the lower ground down here, just south and east, uh, excuse me, south and west of Lincoln, where some locations in here picked up between two and five inches of rainfall. So this has just been the problem, these locally very heavy rainfall amounts. Well, take a look at this. This is where we're going over the next five days. This is the national blended model. Some folks right in through here in the mid-south and part of the southeast, this is our first legitimate chance at getting some rainfall in a long time. So we're going to watch the timing of that. Next, there is some major model differences after this weekend's system that comes through here as to a system that runs through the north central part of the United States and into southern Canada. And we got to talk about that. And then the onshore flow out west, certainly keeping things quite wet in coastal Oregon and Washington over the coming days and putting down some snow here in the higher elevations in the mountains. That's our setup. Let's take a look at what we're expecting here. Let's run out the high resolution NAM model, just getting us out through the next couple of days into early Saturday morning, which is what we're seeing right here. There's this weekend's system coming through right here. But before we get there, let's at least see what we're anticipating throughout the rest of the day today. So early this morning, we were still watching a large shield of precipitation. This is out on the leading edge of the warmer air that's out ahead of this system, moving through Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, over toward Michigan. This does extend into parts of the Ohio River Valley, but getting over here into the northeast Pacific specifically Pennsylvania. Now the frontal boundary you saw it was still draped back into this area so we still have to watch for more showers and storms through the panhandles throughout the morning hours. But it does seem to kind of leapfrog over parts of, of Illinois throughout the day today. All right. Now as we progress forward this is now getting into early morning on Friday. You notice our next system comes into the Pacific Northwest. You can see the widely scattered showers and some thunderstorms there in the Pacific Northwest. And that's the system we're watching emerge here through Idaho uh, in Montana on Friday afternoon. You can see the push out ahead of it as the moisture returns for some widely scattered showers and storms in the midsection of the United States. But the system fully takes shape once we get into the overnight hours on Friday getting into Saturday morning, and there it is. So now what we're doing, you can see that the, the shape of this, bringing in more cold rain here in parts of the Western Dakotas, getting into Central North Dakota, but then out ahead of it, some bigger chances for showers and thunderstorms from Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, getting back into Eastern Nebraska and Kansas. Now that system after that point, well, let's see what the GFS says about it, okay? So I'll pause it right here, this is Friday evening getting into Saturday morning, Saturday midday, Saturday afternoon. So there's the system we're talking about. Now at this point, I'm expecting a widely broken band of showers and storms that stretches from central Wisconsin down into Oklahoma and through here. So some folks in here are gonna get missed by this, but that is the first system that then pushes over toward the east by early Sunday morning. Strong winds behind this. See this up here in the north central plains and the Great Lakes, it's very strong winds behind it. But that system presses east and because of the presence of this high pressure system, we are pushing moisture into this. And as a result, I'm expecting here in the Appalachian Mountains, getting into parts of Tennessee and Kentucky, some real rainfall amounts on Sunday getting into Monday. Now this is where things get really interesting because high pressure builds in, drying things out for Tuesday. The question is how far to the south does this front make it? That is the critical thing to understand because look at the Pacific Northwest by Tuesday morning. We have our next system coming in and that one dives down and takes off straight for southern parts of Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and then over into Ontario. Now here's the trick by Wednesday evening. You can see that the GFS wants to plant a pretty strong low here and connect it up with another low over parts of Oklahoma and Texas, therefore bringing a corridor of rainfall in through this area. As we progress through Thursday, nobody in this area wants to see this actually happen. And I've got good news. There is still major model discrepancy over what's going to happen by next Wednesday into Thursday in this area. And specifically to understand it, take a look at this. This is precipitable water from the GFS. And I'm going to highlight the differences between the GFS and the European model. Watch. 
This is Saturday's system. So where you see the warmer colors, that's an abundance of moisture that can be used to make precipitation. So that's why we saw this corridor wet in the day on Saturday. Drier air moves in behind it, but watch this. This is now Sunday morning, getting into Sunday afternoon. Remember, this is where the rain's all coming into this section of the country. But what is the major difference between the European and the GFS is by Sunday night into Monday morning, here's the difference. The GFS does not take the drier air all the way to the Gulf Coast. And therefore, there is this ribbon of high moisture air that comes right back into Texas. Now watch, ready? Tuesday morning, getting into Wednesday, that moisture resurges, just surges right back up through this region and wraps itself into that newly forming low, such that by the time it moves back over this region here, which has recently seen so much rainfall, it's going to have plenty of moisture to work with. This is not what is going on with the European model. This isn't here in the European model in this region. And as a result, take a look at the differences. This is looking at week two precipitation anomalies. Wet here in the GFS ensemble, not in the European. It is all going to be us watching over the weekend if the moisture return happens or if the front gets far enough to the south that we knock it out. That's the trick for next week's forecast. By the way, the GFS wants to just keep barreling systems through the midsection of the United States and keep us wet for the foreseeable future. Okay, The Euro is a drier model at this point. Now you do notice this in both models, and there is something to be watching in the Caribbean right now. We do need to keep a close eye on what's coming out of the Caribbean going into the Gulf of Mexico over the next five days or so. Uh, uh, National Hurricane Center gave this one about a 20% chance of seeing some development. The point is, is that anything in the Gulf of Mexico this time of year can be very problematic. All right, let's finish up with a quick discussion about South America. Uh, I want to point out a few regions for you. Mato Grosso, right in through this area, we know we've been dealing with drought. We can see that by looking at over the last 90 days of precipitation that we've built up here, a pretty sizable deficit. They've only received about an inch and a half uh, compared to normal, which would be way up here at about 100 millimeters, uh, which would have been substantial. We would have needed that rainfall uh, to get this crop going. So there's still some delays in planting because of the drier weather. Yet recently, some heavier rainfall amounts have come in. Let me take you over here or uh, uh, over here to this region, uh, Goyas, Bahia, you know, Tocantins, this particular corridor. Over there, still very dry, only 70.75 uh, inches of accumulation. They're uh, very much in deficit in their rainfall in this region as well. And finally, if I take you down here a little bit farther south uh, toward Parna, uh, and Rio Grande do Sol, even though they have accumulated 6.5 inches, this is well below their normal uh, in terms of precipitation. So much of Brazil dealing with some drier weather. And it's the same story when you get down into parts of Argentina. So I'm going to take you right here uh, into this region between Santa Fe and Cordoba, this area here, their major corn producing area. Now in Argentina, they do a lot of early planting of corn before beans. Uh, and the problem down here is they're also in deficit and for with precipitation, their last big event coming mid-month, September. So we're watching these areas very carefully over the coming days and weeks as we've not had the same smooth planting progress as we did a year ago. Over the next 15 days, uh, much of eastern Brazil is forecast to stay on the drier side of things, while this section of Brazil may see a return towards some more normal rainfall. I do believe that we've overdone the rainfall amounts down here when you get down into near Uruguay and then Parna and Rio Grande do Sul and also northern Argentina. But we're going to continue to be fooled by this pattern while the Indian Ocean Dipole is in its strong positive phase, giving us these easterly winds here, westerly winds there across the, uh, you know, the tropical Pacific and Indian Ocean. And that is faking us out, making it look like there's a bit of an El Nino pattern. It's also looking like MJO gets stuck in phase one, which is why you see this map continuing to look like this. So we're going to watch it carefully over the coming days and weeks to see how the tropical oceans evolve to change our precipitation patterns across South America. And with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up this forecast video. We at Nutrient Ag Solutions, thank you for your attention. Hope you have a great finish to your week. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.